Yeah, what is going on, my people? Run it back, Philly. Run it back, nation. The family haven't been live on YouTube in a minute. Um, but obviously, I got this 
opportunity to interview, chop it up, sit down and have a conversation with, in my opinion, the most legendary Philly sports broadcaster in the history of the world, Mark Zumoff. Uh, figured we'd come in here, hang out, chop it up, talk to you guys in the chat for a couple of minutes until uh, Mark clicks the link and pops up here. Um, so it's exciting, man. I I, uh, <laughs> I started a YouTube channel almost four years ago, three and a half years ago. Um, it turned into a podcast. It turned into a live show. It turned into a whole bunch of different things. I never would have thought uh, that starting a YouTube channel in under four years, I would be having a conversation with Mark Zumoff. So that's crazy. Uh, but I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna not try to sound like a fanboy up in here. You know what I mean? I'm gonna try to sound like a I'm here too, you know? We're both part of the media. Even though I feel like I'm interviewing somebody legendary and famous. Um I yeah, you know, no fanboyism over here. No frauds, no fanboys, no intros. El Copic, what's up, Mike? Mikey L, what's going on? No entry. James Harden's beard is in the house. Will Gons, MV3, MV3 on playback. Shout out to you, man. Did you make this account just to watch this this live show? Thanks for that. Uh, DW, aka Run It Back Queen, is in the chat. Process in Philly. Shout out to Process in Philly. Follow his Instagram page. It's a good Instagram page, man. Process in Philly. What's been up with you, man? Uh, Mugsy No Bogues. Shifty 2X Bucks fan Harold in here says greatest of all time. I agree. I agree that Mark Zumoff is the greatest of all time. Unless you're talking about me, I don't think I'm the greatest of all time. But I agree Mark Zumoff is the greatest of all time. And I'm interested to uh, you know, chop it up with him. So what's gonna happen is he's gonna come on here. We are just gonna have a conversation. He's gonna tell us about his new podcast that's coming out, and then I'm gonna ask him some questions. I have some interesting questions I want to get, you know, his answer to. I want to get his opinion on some topics. I'm going to get his opinion on the current state of the Philadelphia 76ers, his opinion on Joel Embiid, his opinion on maybe a former player who he called uh, several years of games for who uh, did not work out here in the city of Philly. Um so yeah, I'm gonna you know I'm gonna ask him a couple of interesting things, and we're just gonna have the conversation. Uh, yeah, who else is in the chat, man? Scutter Butter, congrats, DJ. This is awesome. Hey, I appreciate you. Thank you, thank you for being here, DJ D. L. Copic, did I shout you out already? Rand Sand is in the building. Another one that I recognize from Playback TV. Will Gons. Want to make sure I can hear this clearly, so I'm closing all windows and doors. Nice. Well done, Matt. Well done. Um, I put out a video. I just put out a video talking about Joel Embiid's 52 point game. Uh, maybe we'll, maybe we'll ask Mark what he thinks about Joel Embiid and who the MVP is. Uh, Kaleem Clark, what's going on? Mitch Kofsky is in the chat. Mitch Kofsky, what's up, man? How you doing? John in the chat. What's going on? How you doing? Uh, yeah. I might ask him about Joel Embiid and how he feels about the MVP race. How do you guys feel about last night's game? I put, I actually recorded two videos today because I wasn't going to do the, the the normal live show that I've been doing on Playback TV at 12 noon every day because I wanted to, you know, prepare for for this uh for this show. Uh, MV3 says noise canceling headphones. What does that mean? RJ, thanks for being here, man. Matt L, Kaleem Clark. Uh, yeah, I didn't do the live show because I wanted to prepare for this. I wanted to just write up some questions and kind of make a couple graphics and things like that. And I, But I recorded two videos today. The first one I recorded, I put out already. That was the one talking about Joel Embiid's 52-point game um, last night. The second video is kind of the second part of my reaction to that game because it was good. And it was bad. 
it was great as far as Joel Embiid's performance and Joel Embiid's, uh, you know, solidifying the MVP and he should win MVP. Uh, it was an amazing performance, but at the same time, the rest of the team straight up did not show up in one of the, you know, biggest matchups, uh, going towards the end of the season. So that really, uh, frustrates me. And I kind of know what to expect in the second round of the playoffs against the Boston Celtics. They played without Jalen Brown. They played without Robert Williams. Uh, Joel and B was able to go one-on-one against Grant Williams. A lot of the game, even situations, he was able to go one-on-one against Luke Cornett, who, you know, is basically a tall fur con Uh, he just moved him right out of the way and dunked on him. Um, so yeah, what well, you know, what you're going to get in the, in the playoffs is Jalen Brown, Robert Williams, Jason Tatum, uh, the whole Celtic squad, happy Marcus smart, everybody else. And, if the Sixers play the way that they played last night, they might steal one game in that series. And it might be a 65 point playoff game from Joel Embiid. But other than that, I just, I just, I would bet on four to one, man. I really would. And that's frustrating. It's frustrating. Uh, Copic, I'm sensing a Toronto Kawhi playoff run from Joel Embiid. Joel's going to go crazy in the playoffs. If he's healthy, you know, he, he's he's healthy right now. Uh, he was healthy last year until the, you know, br- fractured orbital bone from Pascal Bosiakam. You know how that went. Uh, and then the torn ligament and things like that. But this season, aside from starting the season with plantar fasciitis and then having a sprained ankle and sitting out like, what, three weeks, uh, he's healthy. So I don't want to totally rule out the 76ers because, you know, you just, you don't really know what Joel Embiid, what the team is capable of in the playoffs with a fully healthy Joel Embiid and some better uh, perimeter players on the team. That better than they've had recently. You know what I mean? James Harden, hopefully better than he was in last year's playoffs. Tyrese Maxey, a step forward year three. Um, so I guess you don't really know what to expect exactly. But AMS Hub, was it the coaching or the players last night? Uh, the coaching was horrendous. The players, which was it? Was it both? Um, I got to go coaching first. Lineups, the lineups that, that Doc has been running, uh, his obsession, his flat-out obsession with George Niang uh, just can't happen. It just can't happen in the playoffs. His flat-out obsession with George Niang can't happen in the playoffs. It can't. He's not. He hasn't been giving you anything. This reminds me of that run last year that you know uh, Doc had with Furkan Korkmaz, where he was shooting seventeen percent uh, for you know four straight months, and he continued to play him. So you know, I think it's a little bit of both. But hey, we are up and running. Ladies and gentlemen, the man, the legend, Mark Zumoff. Mark, can you hear me? I apologize. Um, I'm having trouble hearing you. I got to do a little work here, but I think I'll be good. Check one, two, check one, two. Yep, I'm good. All right. Mark Zumoff in the building, ladies and gentlemen. How are you? Well, I have I'm, personally I'm, haven't seen you for for I personally haven't seen you for a couple of years. What's that? I'm sorry. Said so I personally haven't seen you for a couple of years. So how are you? 
That's uh, exactly right. I retired in June of 21. And right now I'm just hiding out and doing podcasts like you. I always hey, wanted man. to be like you. That's, that's, that's why this is all <laughs> happening. You always want to be like, well, I want to tell you, this is, first of all, this is an honor. Um, the first time I heard you, I think I was about 10 years old. I started watching, I started getting into basketball right around when Allen Iverson was drafted. Uh, some of my older cousins w were talking about Jerry Stackhouse. I was right after that time period. And so your voice was obviously a part of uh, 21 years of watching Allen Iverson. 20, 21, how, how many years were you doing it? I did it for 27 years. And before that, I spent 12 seasons as the halftime host. So almost four decades of closely following 76ers basketball. Uh, a lot more than I do now, I have to say. I, I have throttled back. That's not to say the Sixers aren't my first love, but obviously that being a vocation, I am, I won't say I'm more than a casual fan. I'm probably um, a lot more than a casual fan, but not yeah. nearly as, uh, as assiduous, if I could pull out a $10 word, as I was back in the day. Well, four, four decades, you know, maybe after that you want to get do some other things for decades of, of covering a team. I, I understand that. Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for at least my time listening to you was about 21 years. So thank you for 21 years of entertainment. And uh, Allen Iverson was my idol growing up. I, I got into basketball. I taught myself how to dribble a basketball watching Allen Iverson, which probably fundamentally isn't, you know, the correct thing to do. But, you know, I had to cross over when I was a teenager. And uh, yeah, you were a part of all of it. So thank you. Um and, and I appreciate you guys reaching out to me and being a part of this little uh, podcast run that you're going, this promotional run that you're going on promoting your new podcast. So thank you. Uh, listen, thank you for having me on. And I have to say that I have a lot of admiration and respect for guys like you who are creating their own following, their own brand. And, you know, back in the day, there were three or four TV channels in Philly and a handful of radio stations. And if you didn't work for one of them, well, that was it. Well, now with the internet, and uh, let me pull it out of my pocket here, this, this little baby right here, which has kind of uh, revolutionized our business and, in fact, has revolutionized the world in some respects. Um, there are, it's created a lot of opportunity, and people like you have jumped in, and I have a lot of uh, respect for that. So uh, good job by you developing the audience and the following that you have. Hey, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. So, yeah, uh, I guess – First off, tell us about the new podcast that you have. The first episode is up and live. The link is in the description of this video. Uh, go ahead and just tell us about the new podcast. The podcast is called Fresh 24. We were kind of racking our brains for a title, and we finally came up with one of the many different sayings that I had, or phrases, in this case, Fresh 24. And now, of course, if uh, you take a shot and you miss and the other team touches the ball, goes out of bounds, uh, you get a fresh 14, but back then it was a fresh 24. And so, um, you know, I said that for most of the 27 years that I did the game. So that's the title of it. And basically what this is, is people who have played for, coached for the 76ers, have been in the front office or have some other relationship or are just fans of the team. So you could be hearing from Allen Iverson. You could be hearing from Joel Embiid. You could be hearing from Doc Rivers. You could be hearing from somebody in the front office. And you could be hearing from a seasoned ticket holder who's a successful business person. Or you could be hearing from an entertainer or someone of uh, notoriety or someone who maybe no one's ever really heard of. But uh, they've done very well in their particular field of endeavor, and they share the love of the Sixers. So everybody will have that one common piece of their heart and soul, and that is a love for the team. So at some point in the interview, we'll get around to the Sixers, their love of the Sixers, how they feel about the team. And, and uh, you know, it could be somebody like Lil Dicky or Kevin Hart who grew up in the area. At least that's that's what we're trying to aspire to. Hey, I love it, man. I love it. And what what better voice to be behind the mic than the guy that that called uh, Sixers games for 27 years? So I love it. I'm excited to listen to it. I haven't listened to the first episode yet. I'm excited to listen to it. Kate Scott was your first guest, correct? She was, and we just thought it natural since she took over for me. And I, 
I love her. She, she's my sister and she's great at what she does. And in fact, when I was asked to judge the finalists, uh, needless to say, uh, it was very hard. And I gave everybody high grades, including her. She was terrific in her audition. She's a professional and she is breaking new ground in many, many ways. Being a woman, doing um, a man's sport in a league where for the first 73 years, they had only men as broadcasters. So now, along with Lisa Byington in Milwaukee, they are uh, pioneers in many respects. And it's not easy. It's not easy for a lot of reasons. And it's not easy because there are a lot of people out there who are mean, who are not welcoming, who are against having a woman in any respect, having a platform like that. And you'll hear from Kate, in fact, it's out there on social, some of the meanness that she had to deal with. And it's vulgar and it's disrespectful and but unfortunately, it's been part of what she's had to endure in her short time here in Philly. Yeah, I can imagine with all of the, uh, the, the benefits of the technology, like you said, you pulled your phone out and said this revolutionized uh, what we do. With all of the benefits come that, the fact that anybody can say whatever they want with generally no repercussions whatsoever. And that just kind of that kind of uh, motivates people to be even worse because they know that they can get away with it. So that's the sucky part of it. But. Um, yeah, I mean, I can't imagine what she deals with being a, a woman in a man's sport and being a broadcaster and taking over for you and being a woman and being a broadcaster. She probably hears a lot of, you know, she, you got a tough skin and I think she does, man. I think she, I think she does, but yeah, I'm excited to listen to it. Um, I want to get into a, a major question that I have, cause I've always wondered this about you. Um, what set you apart from broadcasters in my opinion was your just original style and what you brought to the table uh the catchphrases that you had throughout your career that are just you know legendary in 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 the the lives of people like me who listened to you for that many years uh i could name probably all of them off the top of my head uh i always wonder did you sit down with like a pen and paper one day and say i need something that's going to set me apart from other broadcasters and i need catchphrases and put <laughs> thought into into writing these down like a like like Eminem writing a rap song or did they just come naturally? Like you were just calling a game and you said, wow, that was, that was fun. Let me remember that one. So let me say you're half right in that I did feel as though I wanted to put my imprint on it only because that's really all you can bring to a broadcast is who you are as an individual. When you find your voice as a broadcaster, you think about the experiences you've had, your personal view on the game, your love of the team. In this case, uh, it was natural for me because I'm from the city. I grew up in Northeast Philly. And so uh, I always felt like I wanted to put my own imprint on it while at the same time not feeling as though I was bigger than the game or bigger than a particular moment. And so one day, uh, George Lynch, who played for the Sixers in the Allen Iverson era and was part of that 2001 team, missed a shot and put it back. And for some reason, the phrase turning garbage into gold occurred to me, and that became the signature call for many an offensive rebound and put back. And let me digress and say this, that I spent 12 years, as I mentioned earlier, as the halftime host. And in doing that, I did a lot of writing. I wrote a lot of uh, what are called teases that you hear at the beginning of games. I scripted a lot of features, which would air at halftime. And it's funny because as I did that for 12 years, while I was happy to be doing it, I always would pine for being the voice of the team. But it was good for me to do that because what it did was, because of all the writing that I did, it made me comfortable with the English language. And so crafting phrases became easier. And so I learned the value of alliterations, meaning turning garbage into gold. And alliteration, an example of it is right there. And so uh, stuff like that just sort of occurred to me. Um, some, uh, I would say most times it would occur to me during the game. I'd float it out there. And of course, now that we have this in social media, I was able to gauge pretty quickly whether or not people liked it. Um, 
And uh, for the most part, I, I would like to think that many of the phrases people did like. And so that's the derivation of that. And then after that came, hang on, Oliver, coming in for a landing or any one of a number that you uh, you say that you can recite and uh, were used, uh, I think, quite frequently. And again, uh, you know, people can already see what's going on in the game because you're the TV broadcaster. And so you have to think of different ways to sort of lend an additional layer or some texture to the broadcast to kind of make it unique. And I think that's one of the reasons why I came up with so many phrases as well. Yeah. And I think, I think you were really good at doing it in a, in a, in a natural way. It didn't come off as you were, you were trying to be the star of the show or, or, or really trying too hard to be an entertainer or anything like that. It just really came off in a really original organic way. And I think that's why it was so uh, well received that I wanted to tell you the most memorable one that I have, the one that I always remember right when I think of a, uh, one of those phrases um, it was a double overtime game with the Boston Celtics towards the end of Allen Iverson's career. That, 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 that second half of his career when he was playing with Andre Iguodala and Kyle Korver and Kyle Korver hit a, a 40 footer to send it to, to overtime and he hit a 40 footer to send it to double overtime. And it was just the craziest mm -hmm. thing. And that I was with two friends in my, in my mom's basement. I think I was, I don't know, eight, 17 years old. And that's the first time I heard you say, hold on, Allah, we're coming in for landing. And I remember my friends laughing. Like we all laughed because it was like such a, such a, uh, just a, a thing that stood out for, for a broadcaster to say. And so I always remembered that one. Uh, in that specific game. But yeah, I, I just think you did it in such an organic way that it didn't come off, come across as like you were trying to steal the show or be an entertainer. You just would throw them in there here and there. And as the kind of, as the intensity of the game got higher, the intensity of your calls got higher and it was just, I think perfectly in sync. So that's what you know, I you're very, you're very kind to say that. And I do remember that game very well. Um, I, I know that we are live and I want to apologize. I'm expecting a repair person here and I'm by myself. Can you vamp for me for a minute until I can uh, answer the door? Yeah, absolutely. No problem. All right. Hang on for just a second. Yeah. Shout out to Mark Zumoff's repair person. Um, hopefully the repair person turns garbage into gold. <laughs> Yeah, that was well done, wasn't it? Did you guys like that? Sorry, bro. I got my uh, I got my son who's visiting to see if uh, the repair person is here. I got a call here on my phone, and I realize that this is somewhat unusual. But you know what? That's the beauty of podcasting: the fact yeah. that you know it's so informal, and even though we're live, we can. <laughs> <laughs> take yeah. a pause to see if the repair guy is here so uh, -huh. uh my apologies and thank you for your indulgence yeah yeah i think that's what people like about podcasting man it's like a real uh, a real insight into you know just a, a couple of guys with microphones there's no real uh narrative or someone telling you what to say or anything like that so yeah by the no, way by the way i want to comment on the beard I'm loving it. You know, I'm a beard guy, of course. Once I started to lose my hair in college, that's the only way I could show that I could grow hair of any kind. <laughs> and so I've always had one yeah. in some form or fashion. And I and I like what you're doing there. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Um, the 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 secret is just to not shave ever. So <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, people sell beard products and stuff. I could probably get into something like that, but really it's all fugazi. You just don't shave. That's just what you do. There's nothing that you know, people ask me sometimes, how do you how can I get one like that? I just I just haven't shaved it for you know three or four years that's it right right well speaking of which if you don't mind i'm going to give a shout out to uh my guys at maestros they uh they make a great beard product and if you're ever interested i'll put you in touch yeah yeah put me in touch man maestros yeah let's do yeah, it Yeah, maestros yeah let's do it so, so go ahead i apologize <laughs> no it's okay that's fine we, were, I, we really ran far afield this time Hey, I'm fine with compliments. I started a YouTube channel a little under four years ago, and uh, in three and a half years, I'm talking to Mark Zumoff, and he complimented my beard. So that's that's fine with me. Cool, cool. Uh, another question that I had: How do you feel overall about Allen Iverson's career, and do you think the organization kind of didn't take advantage of his talent overall? Did, did, did the organization fail Allen Iverson, basically? 
Well, I do believe that he is part of the organization in some form. I don't think that you can find his name on the staff directory if you go to the team's official website. But I do know that he does some appearances for them and some ambassadorships. So uh, there is not a total disconnect for sure. And um, as far as anything else, I know that Alan may have expressed an interest in doing some front office work. I don't know where those conversations went, so I don't want to comment on anything that I don't know that much about. But um, all, all I know is that his career in Philly was something that I don't think we'll ever see again, or at least certainly not in my lifetime. And, you know, as I say that, I'm a lot closer to the end than the beginning, but I'm not sure you will see it in your lifetime based on the fact that he was, first of all, so unique as a player. And so unique as an individual. And he did things that a little man and, you know, I, I, I go back to people like Nate Archibald and, you know, certainly the Muggsy Bogueses of the world and players like that. But uh, winning four scoring titles and multiple all-star games and everything else and just his playing style. And he did it not in this era where um, I think defensive players – have to keep their hands off and it's not nearly as physical. He did it in an era where the NBA was unbelievably physical, where if you scored 95, 96 points, it was considered an average night. Now you have teams after three quarters in the nineties and maybe even in the hundreds. So um, I, he had his number retired. I, I would like to think that it's all love between the club and Allen. Certainly it's all love between the fans and Allen. And um, I hope to have him on my my podcast at some point. Hey, I, w- I would love to listen to that episode if you have Alan Iverson on there for sure. Yeah, yeah, I think I think in in I think the new age of of social media and stuff too has brought on a lot of uh, a lot of I call them calculator boys. I call them uh, a- anybody that kind of overhypes advanced analytics versus just watching the game. And you know, I, I refuse to really even have the conversation about Alan Iverson to. Uh, anyone who didn't have the pleasure of watching his career live because you can watch, you know, a YouTube compilation of highlights or whatever, but you really don't, don't get the idea just from that. And then they look at, you know, they'll bring up his efficiency numbers. And I just think it's a perfect example of how the numbers don't always mean everything. Um, Allen Iverson was just, it's why I related to him because I, I started playing basketball because uh, I was playing football and some other sports and, and I was always the tiniest, skinniest kid. And mm-hmm. I found something that I could be really good at that. I didn't have to be bigger and stronger than everyone. I just had to be faster. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I just, uh, you know, I just think he's a perfect example of, of somebody just with their back against the wall, who, when you look at the size and you look at all of the things he wasn't supposed to be even be close to doing what the things that he was doing to be dropping 48 points in a game against the, one of the greatest Lakers teams of all time in the NBA finals, uh, Shaq and Kobe. I mean, it's, it's just really insane when you look at it and he's the size of the average guy walking down the street. That's really what it was for me with Allen Iverson. So, um, yeah, he was amazing, man. And I, I, I wish everybody, you know, would somehow, have gotten the way to watch his career, but uh, yeah, I want to pay, I want to pay off one of the things you had talked about as it relates to analytics. And as far as I know of all the different esoteric stats that analytics presents, there is no measure for heart. And that's what endears him to Sixers fans the most. I will say on a more broad based answer, the issue of analytics is something that, uh, is here to is here to stay. Quite honestly, it's it's a way to break down the game. Uh, I know that certainly player moves are made with respect to analytics. That coaching moves are made with respect to analytics. Though I don't think it dictates every single move or everything that's done by a coach in a particular game. It's a tool like anything else. And so you're right. You can look at a player and maybe efficiency or some other stat isn't what um, you would expect from a a multiple all-star like him. But uh, what kind of effect does a player have not only in terms of heart, but uh, personality wise in the locker room, all that stuff I think is still uh, accountable and accounted for 
And so um, analytics, I, I know, is here to stay, but I think it's only a, a, a part of what goes into running a professional basketball team. Yeah, absolutely. How do you think Allen Iverson would do with uh, today's um, load management? Uh, I remember a story. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard this story before where they, they, they told him he wasn't playing in this game. Uh, they, they took his jersey. He took someone else's jersey. And they took his shoes and he sent somebody around the corner to a footlocker to buy him new shoes. And he, cause he was just going to play in the game. And I feel like today there's more scheduled. There's a lot more, you know, uh, fitness, professional science, sports science that goes into rest days. And, you know, how can we make sure this player's a hundred percent, uh, headed towards the playoffs and things like that with the, the load management of today. I don't remember, you know, Allen Iverson having, uh, rest days or scheduled rest days or even hardly coming off the floor. I remember in the playoffs, he used to play 48 straight minutes. Do you think they would have a tougher time with, with AI today trying to tell him that, you know, you're, you're not playing on Monday? So a couple of things come to mind. I am interviewing Billy Cunningham later today for my podcast. And one of the players we're going to be talking about is Wilt Chamberlain, Philly guy who, uh, for the really young out there who don't know the history, played in the 60s and 70s. And just look up his stats. They're, they're mind-boggling. And one of the stats that we'll no doubt talk about is the fact that one season, he averaged over 48 minutes a game. And I think he missed one game. And that's because he was tossed from the game by the officials. And you could look at the careers of, say, Carl Malone or John Stockton, 81 games, 82, 82, 81, 80. Uh, those are guys who never sat. And you're right about Alan. He uh, abhorred sitting. And I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that the way he grew up, the squalor that he grew up in and everything else that was involved in his upbringing, that one of the few places he could find joy was on the playing field or on the court. And so to not be able to experience that joy because he had to sit for an injury was not something that he was trying to hear. I remember there was one game, and Kevin Johnson, who is currently the trainer for the Sixers, tells this story where uh, Allen broke his thumb. And he had a game the next night, and he was fit to be tied that there was a chance he wasn't going to play. And Kevin stayed up all night fashioning this cast for his thumb that he could play with, and it was on a shooting hand. And I remember he wore it for the game and came out missed his first five shots, and at some point in the first quarter went running by the bench, pulled the thing off his thumb and threw it at Kevin and said, here, you take it. I'm playing without it. And so this is who he was. And again, it's one of the many reasons, his passion for playing, that uh, we embrace him to this day. It sounds like an Allen Iverson story if I've ever heard one, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, Moving to more to more recent uh, Philadelphia 76ers things, I just want to get your opinion on a couple of things. Do you have a general opinion on Ben Simmons' time in Philadelphia and kind of where he is now and maybe where or how it, it, it went wrong? I know you called three or four seasons of, of Ben. Um, you are the voice behind the iconic first three-point attempt <laughs> um, and I was just actually telling my girlfriend about it a couple of minutes ago because we were celebrating a player shooting a three pointer, which sounds silly in hindsight, but they, if the people didn't understand the context of the situation, uh, do you just have a general opinion on, on the Ben Simmons, uh, era in Philly and, uh, what happened maybe? Well, it's, it's not that easy to answer in you know, a brief sentence or two. What I see is some responsibility on Ben's part, but also an issue that may not be his fault and probably would have required a little more compassion than was shown to him. So let's take the second part first. The compassion for him would be the issue of mental health. And the fact that if a player gets hurt, I'm talking about physically, knee, ankle, whatever it happens to be, and cannot play, we understand that, we appreciate that, and we'll give that player a pass. But when it comes to mental health, because it's hidden, and it's a mind issue or a brain issue, if you will, 
we are less understanding about that. And Ben Simmons clearly has and continues to have, I would think, some mental health challenges. All of that said, he does have to bear some responsibility for holes in his game. And while the broadcaster for the team, I was one of those who embraced what he could do and didn't necessarily criticize what he couldn't do. But the fact that he didn't do certain things, meaning shoot or shoot the three, uh, was clearly something that he had to bear at least some responsibility for. Uh, not shooting free throws very, very well, not going to the line as often as a point guard should. Uh, that had to have been uh, a better part of his game. Now, all that had, could have been related to his mental health issues. And so, you know, it's hard to define what it was that could be attributed to mental health issues and what could be attributed to maybe Ben should have worked harder on those aspects of his game. So that's the long answer to your short question. I will say that at 6'10", and for doing what he did, he was a freak. He was a guy who, and I say that uh, as a compliment, the fact that he could play point guard, he was a willing passer, he could defend anybody on the floor. I mean, those are some very valuable assets. And keep in mind, he was an all-star, not necessarily from fan voting, but because the Easter Conference coaches voted him as a reserve which means that they understood and respected his game, even though he didn't shoot from the outside or take threes or was necessarily that good from the line. And so it's not a simple uh, answer, but um, I do wish him um, uh, well in terms of his mental health issues. And while he does play for the Nets or probably will never play for the Sixers again, I hope he has uh, a good rest of his career in the NBA. Yeah, I, I always kind of said, no matter how frustrated I got uh, throughout the years of, of wishing he would do certain things, um, I always I always say, even recently, I, I said, uh, as a basketball fan, I would like for him to just kind of come out of it and, and you know, do what, what we kind of thought his his potential was, uh, you know, when he came out of college, just as just as, a, you know, I don't want to I never like rooted for anyone to fail it was just frustrating you know as a Sixers fan uh when he was here but yeah if if he can overcome the things that he's dealing with he's still he's still what 26 27 thereabouts um, thereabouts yeah. yeah he's got yeah. the better part of his career left to go right exactly exactly um how do what do you think when you retired from broadcasting was there was it just was it just 26 years is enough you know what i mean did I don't know how to ask this and I don't want this to be offensive, but did, uh, did a couple of years of calling the process maybe wear on you a little bit, the three years where you kind of knew the Sixers weren't at least roster wise, trying to put a team on the floor that was trying to really win a lot of games. How frustrating was that as a broadcast broadcaster? And I think you did an amazing job by the way, to, to call all of those games and make it sound interesting when you know, everybody kind of knew what was going on. Well, first, thank you for the compliments. And I will say this, who out there hasn't thought and, you know, I, who out there hasn't thought, wow, what a really cool job Zumoff had or has uh, to be the voice of a team, to get paid to go to games, to travel with the team, to stay in their hotel, to fly the charters to be there with the players, to be the soundtrack for great moments or not so great moments. It's the gig of a lifetime. There are only, there are fewer NBA broadcasters than there are U S senators. And there's only a hundred of those. And so what you have to remember is to not forget that, that it's the gig of a lifetime, especially for a kid who grew up in Northeast Philly and saw his first Sixer game in 1963 when the team moved from Syracuse and never looked back and just always loved it and wanted to be the voice of the Sixers when he was a kid. And so given all of that, you learn to deal with the ups and downs uh, of a team from season to season, and you become professional about it. And so what I did was just merely accept the challenge of doing the games of a 10-win team. 
and you find smaller stories to talk about or you talk about the opponent and you just get into the game and you respect and remember your job and that's it. Uh, I learned a long time ago that I have absolutely positively zero control of what goes on on the floor. And so I just merely broadcast the games. I embrace it. I try to enjoy it. I make the best of a bad situation and hope for things to get better. And listen, they did. Um, and I had a great ride in 2001. And I had a great ride up until the time that I retired these last few years. So absolutely no frustration. And um, I just consider myself one of the luckiest guys on the face of the earth. And it's a great way to look at it, man. That's a great way to look at it. And that can go a long way. People can take uh, people can take notes from a guy like you. <laughs> remain po remain positive in all aspects of life, and uh, you know, just keep working hard and keep staying positive, and you can get to wherever you want to be. That's um, right. The last thing I want to ask you, I know you have a, a full schedule. You're making your rounds, you know, like Louis C.K. promoting a new mm -hmm. stand up. You're making your rounds to <laughs> you're making your rounds to promote a, a, a podcast. <laughs> That's my favorite comedian of all time. Yeah, um, right. Do you have – what's your just general opinion on the Sixers right now? I know you said you're a above casual fan right now. You're not obsessed with it. You're not into it like you were when you were calling them for so many years. What's your opinion on the team right now, maybe Joel Embiid, and do they have a chance to win an NBA championship uh, in the next couple of months? I think there's always a chance – I know that every Sixer fan desperately wants to see the team get past the second round. If they don't get past the second round, I don't think the season was a success at all. Um, you have to figure Brooklyn in the first round. You have to figure the Celtics in the second. That seems to be the way it's shaping up. And like all athletic competitions, the primary thing is good health. Now, I know both Embiid and James Harden played last night. I don't know uh, how they're feeling. You would think that they will get some rest. They'll certainly get some rest while they're doing the play-in tournament. And so how will they hit the ground once the playoffs begin? Um, I'd like to think that they have what it takes. They're an above-average defensive team, which I always look for. They're certainly a very good shooting team. And they have who I think is the MVP of the league, though I'm not sure he'll get it, in Joel Embiid. And he clearly showed that last night. So I, I, I can only say this. I'm not a prognosticator. And again, I don't have the knowledge to sit and think about how they're going to match up with Brooklyn or the Celtics for that matter. What I do know is I think they have the team to do it, to get to the NBA Finals. And let's hope that they're able to do it. Can't ask for a better answer than that. And yeah, I, I Joel Embiid is actually a, a, on certain betting apps right now, a minus 600 to win MVP after last night. So uh, he is currently the favorite. I, I think it was wild how the, it was going back and forth. And then he kind of said like, okay, four games left. I got the Boston Celtics. If I have to show everyone one more time that I can dominate an entire NBA game from start to finish just to get this MVP award, then I'm going to do that. And I think that's what he did last night. Yeah, the, the only thing is, um, and they, they played with fire at the end of that game, but, uh, you know, you, your, your best player scores 52 and you don't win by much. And the other team is missing one of their two best players. So, you know, I don't, I don't really know what that means. Uh, and quite frankly, as I'm sitting here and I'm analyzing it myself, uh, the regular season has very little to do with the playoffs. It's totally different. The mentality is different. And I've seen teams sweep other teams during the regular season and then get swept themselves by that team in the playoffs. So um, that's the beauty of sports that nobody really knows that you try to make a prediction and things uh, come out totally different. But I'm really excited for this regular season to finally come to an <laughs> end and get to the postseason for sure. Yeah, the regular season these days becomes. Uh, I I feel like this. I don't remember this growing up. I don't remember the NBA being like this. But I feel like now, uh, you know, you kind of know what teams are going to be in the playoffs, and, and teams that have a couple of superstars on their squad know that they're going to be in the playoffs, and they kind of just don't really take the regular season too seriously. They know like we got to win, you know, fifty games. 
week. That means we can kind of jog around for 32 of them, maybe rest for 20 and jog around for 12 games. So, uh, yeah, that, that seems to be the thing now. And, and, and you're right about that. The mentality is totally different in the playoffs. The attention's totally different. Uh, everything's different. And I, I too am ready for the regular season to end. We got a couple of games left. Um, that's all I got. Mark Zumoff, thank you so much for joining the show. Uh, go ahead and plug the podcast one more time, whatever you want to say. Any last words, man? Appreciate you. I got my boilerplate stuff here. I am asking everyone to please drop a follow to Fresh 24 with Mark Zumoff on all social media platforms and subscribe to the show on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. And again, our first episode dropped this morning at 6 a.m. Kate Scott, she's got some amazing things to say and really some troubling things to say as well. But she smiles uh, nonetheless, and she continues to soldier on. And uh, I think you'll find uh, that podcast next week. We're going to have J.J. Reddick, and we're going to roll on and try to bring you the best guests possible. All right, Mark. Thanks again, man. I appreciate it so much. You got it, my man. Have a good one. Thanks, you too.